All right, welcome to another episode of the Esports Next podcast. It is my pleasure today to be joined alongside the lovely co-host, MVP Megan Van Petten, founder of the Esports Trade Association. We have Matt Archibald, who is the head of commercial partnerships for the Americas for Riot Games. If you have anything to do with esports or gaming, you know Riot. Matt, welcome to the show today. Thanks, guys. Very happy to be here. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. We're excited to have you. Um, you are going to be one of our speakers at the conference. And so for those listening, if um, this is your one chance in life to get in touch with Riot, just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you would like to meet Matt and have a casual conversation, I'm sure he would oblige in Chicago, August 20th through 22nd. Uh, Matt, um, why don't you tell us what exactly is your role? Kind of what is that day to day that you are um, performing with uh, partners and potential partners for Riot Games. Yeah, for sure. So my my role as head of commercial partnerships for for Riot in the Americas um, sits across um, three of our local offices. So our LAX office, our Mexico City office, and also our Sao Paulo office. So um, in Riot's geography, it's basically North, Central, and South America. And then we've also been working across Oceania as well. So Australia and New Zealand. Um, but what that really means is that sitting across our entire portfolio of titles, both on the competitive side and then the uh, uh, marketing and sort of general publishing side, uh, myself and team is responsible for engaging, connecting with all third party partners, those that we integrate into our esports ecosystems, those that we might look to do amplifications around for big beats that we have with new champions, new agents, new skin launches, things along those lines, um, and really just be that kind of conduit, right, uh, in many ways to, to the outside world, help them understand Riot a little bit more, help us get our message out there to make sure that we're putting players first and that we're focusing on everything. And so I've been at Riot for, geez, five years now. Um, I happen to be one of one of those. Uh, we've grown a lot in the last five years, but um, I came on board back when we were still trying to put the S in Riot Games uh, with the old meme. So it was just League of Legends. And now yep. that portfolio um, has has grown quite a bit. So it's actually a lot of fun, a lot of exciting to see different genres, different communities, different ways of approaching, um, you know, different facets of that 18 to 34 year old demo that, you know, like 14 to 30 year old demo. So it's, it's really been a lot of fun. That's really cool. You know, you're in a unique place because you have the most established, most popular global esport title in League of Legends. And then you've got one of the hottest newer games, although I guess it's been around a year or two now in Valorant, um, I guess in <laughs> in the esports world that's not new anymore i suppose but i'd be very curious to get your take as as head of partnerships what is the experience like working with a legacy title that is you know a lot of people know of like hey if if you've got budget and you've got a global reach league of legends is a great solution because of the the success there versus we're launching a brand new one we don't maybe take you back a year or two. We don't know yet how well it'll be accepted or how well it'll do. And then building that ecosystem, what is the the difference and maybe some of the similarities in those two very different sides of the industry there? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. It is one that we we have a lot of discussions around. I think both internally and externally, right? Um, on the one hand, you have League of Legends and League of Legends esports, which has been around for. Oh gosh, what's going on almost 14 years from a competitive standpoint at this point. Um, you know, in many ways, I think just the overarching industry tends to think that esports has been around for like 300 years and it's been around longer than the NFL and longer than the NBA. And you have to think that we're, we're, we're not, right? Like we're still very, very early days. It's just everyone is very quick to want to move and move and move. And so, you know, it's amazing that we have this this amazing platform, this incredibly like strong platform, both in the West and the Eastern parts of the world with League of Legends, right? It continues every year, right? It pushes ourselves. Some early, early things that I've seen teasers of for Worlds this year in Korea are gonna be amazing. Uh, it's like every year things are better and better. And you're like, how are you even doing this? Where are we finding the time? So um, that's really incredible. 
And now on the other end, you have Valorant, right? Which is a brand new genre. It's come out a genre Riot has never been involved in before. And it's a completely new IP, right? It's IP that's not in Runeterra. It does not follow TFT or Legends of Runeterra, um, you know, or Wild Rift. It is a completely different thing. Valorant is its own space. So in many ways, we entered into this brand new thing. Yes, like we happened to launch during periods of time where people were at home, et cetera. But in order to build that long tail, it's all the work and effort that went into it. So on the one hand, you know, you have kind of that security blanket that is League of Legends. It is there. Yes, you were joking earlier. It's not the easiest game to just pick up and go, aha, I got it, right? Uh, it takes a little bit of time. The beauty of that is that once, you, once you're hooked, you're pretty much hooked uh, for a very, very long time. Um, right. So there's, there's education there. There's stability. There's growth. There's everything else, right? Um, and then on the Valorant side, to your point, it is. It's that rocket ship. It's growing and it's growing. And as we've just sort of been able to push ourselves into other markets, you're seeing this from a tax shooter standpoint just really, really take off, right? And, and it's incredible. But if we start to peel that back, right, and you start to look at who are you talking to? What are those demographics? Where are we going? We're still talking to 18 to 34 year olds primarily, right? So the core marketing message of who you're talking to is that younger demographic. The thing that's amazing is that people who play League don't play Valorant, right? Like there's some crossover, but it's it's a small percentage of duplication. So it's not like, aha, I've hit the League audience. I'm done with Riot. It's like, I've hit the League audience wow, 80% of these people don't know what Valorant is? That's interesting, right? And same thing with Valorant. They're like, that was their first exposure to Riot. So in many ways, when we're approaching this and looking at it with partners and brands and even getting into the community side with tournament operators and everything else, you're basically looking at coverage across the market, right? And I know right. there's some data we have where, you know, looking at this even from a macro level can get much more granular into like regional levels. But, you know, from a macro level, if you look at League of Legends um, esports fans and Valorant esports fans and you compare those with like some YouGov data, we're reaching like 95% of that that demographic that exists, right? Which is yeah. pretty incredible. Also knowing that it's not just duplication. Um, and I think beyond that, you will, can also break it down with, as we were saying earlier, the sustainability and everything. League of Legends, you've had like regional leagues, the LCS been around for 10 years, other leagues, the LEC, LCK, LPL have all been around. Valorant, brand new. We just launched these international leagues this year. It's a little bit more of what you would call kind of the, the football or soccer for, for us Americans here, um, you know, yeah. mentality where there's an America's League, a MIA League and Pacific League. And, you know, what's amazing about that is that's new. So as a brand, you can get into literally the foundation and help reshape what we're going to do. And on the other hand, you have league where you're coming into something that you know is there. And then you can just say, okay, where can we take this? How can we better engage with this demographic? And I think that's really the core thing is that if depending on the fun sizzle aspect of what you're getting, which is always glitz and glamour and entertainment and high quality, all the way down to the pure media elements of who are you targeting and is it the same and are they nuanced? And you know, we all know our communities don't watch traditional sports. They don't do a lot of other things. So there's really no other way to connect with them unless you're within this ecosystem that we are all are. And the ecosystem is so unusual. I've been going to the United Center forever uh, to sporting events, but last year's um, LOL event here in Chicago was unbelievable. It was like... Um, First of all, I never saw the United Center that way. And I go back to being on the floor with Jordan. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this this was an experience last year here. And I just kept thinking to myself, there are so many people I want to be here to see this. And I can't wait. Oh, yeah. And you, uh, speaking of that, LCS Champs is coming up in Newark very soon, Matt. Um, I, I always, I think the thing that people are most surprised by who have not been to a pro esports event is the energy in That's the That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Like and, um, why don't you share a little bit, uh, Matt, maybe help some of our folks, some of our listeners who haven't been there, maybe they're on the, the edge of their seat. Should I go to the, to the LCS or should I not? Or what, what can we expect being that arena from your perspective? Um, I'll do that. One quick thing. I just, I have to address something that Megan said, because before I moved to LA, I lived in Chicago. I went through high school and stuff in the Northern suburbs. Going back to the United Center last year for me was, was like it? quite literally trippy. Like it was- Wasn't it crazy? 
I, I was like emotional in a way that I did Me not too. To be. I was walking around being able to walk like the behind the scenes of that entire stadium, mm. right? Where I had Same. done it, it was Chicago stadium and everything else, but to see it, you know, I'm pretty sure my team was like, are you okay? And I'm like, I just, Same. I just need a moment. Right. And like seeing it was, was super cool. It was um, beyond. It was, do you want, you want to know what I did too? Sorry, John. We're like fanning out because it's, it was, it, it was, it was in, incredible last year. Um, you know what I did? I did the most interesting day. I went as a guest of educators. I don't know how I got on that list, but do you guys remember that you brought a whole group of educators? Yep. I think it was complimentary. And and all Chicago public educators of some sort got to come in and experience esports complimentary. And there was this day of education and these panels. Maybe I was asked to be on a panel. I can't remember exactly. So I was behind the scenes from 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 and with through the entire day as a special, you know, complimentary guest from right. I thought that was so special as well. You know, what you guys did so many things. It was so executed so brilliantly from the fan fest. I mean, literally John, there's, there's nothing like it as a Chicago and born and raised like this event. Isn't that fair, Matt? It, it was pretty amazing. I will also say that we ended the night. Well, ended the night slash early the following morning um, at the Redhead Piano Bar downtown, which oh, I've been I there. Say... <laughs> last year's last year's conference. <laughs> Is that yeah, and... where I was wondering? That's one of oh, the best places ever. Happens. Watching Cloud9 pros, I will not say their names, attempting to do karaoke at I don't know, some very, very reasonable hour of the day, of course, um, yes. is also something that I will not soon forget just because of everything else that's going there. Um, but anyway, to your point, John, this weekend is going to be awesome. So we are going to the Prudential Center <laughs> Another weekend. Um, in Newark, New Jersey. Um, we have like the semifinals on Saturday, the finals on Sunday. There are three teams that are there. Cloud9 is going to be waiting for the winner of Saturday in the championship. On Saturday, we have Team Liquid, Team Liquid Honda, um, and NRG are competing. Um, we actually will have um, a Fan Fest similar, right? So Fan Fest is going to be opening, I believe it's at 11 or 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time each day. You've got three to four hours just outside walking around. We have pretty much every LCS team is showing up there. We have a lot of our league partners that are going to be there. I know Red Bull's planning on a really kind of fun, uh, a fun little excursion adjacent to it. Um, and, you know, we have some amazing partners there as well with Grubhub and Verizon and, and everybody else. So it's it's really just a great opportunity to look. Watching at home is awesome. We all love that. Right. But being able to be in kind of that safe space around people to express yourself in your true fandom, whether that's the jersey of your favorite team, even if that team isn't there, doesn't matter. Or you want to dress up in your own cosplay, you have a favorite champion, whatever it happens to be. It's just getting that exposure, that experience. Um, you know, look, in, in the years I've been here, I've worked in other places where we'd have fan fest and people would show up and be there for 20 minutes, walk around, punch card and take off. And every single time it's just mobbed and people were like, oh my gosh, who is that? And then we were meet and greets with pros and we bring creators in. And so it's, there's just, it's to the point Megan was bringing up, there's just this energy that is there to be outside and inside. And then you come in, our opening ceremony is going to be pretty amazing. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really good stuff. There's going to be a lot of lasers, probably some more pyro. Uh, we are not the WWE, but there's going to be pyro. Um, and I think we're going to see some really, really awesome things. Prudential is an area we've been looking to get to for, for a little bit of time. And we're really excited. It all came together. Yeah. And to your point, you, know, you guys are sharing, you know, the the excitement of going to a stadium that you've been to many many times throughout your youth and and it's kind of like it's it's almost I would say like a symbol like esports has arrived right when you're seeing what you're doing now on the same level as uh, the the sports events that you attended so those who have had that exact same experience with the Prudential Center whether you're New Jersey Devil fans or other you have the opportunity to come and, and share that same experience. Um, you shared a little bit talking about the differences between Valorant and League about 
the um, the uniqueness of the audience with the different genres, right? And I'm curious to dig in a little bit with you on that. There's a lot of brands, a lot of people from the outside, they're like, we're trying to reach the gamers, you know? So I'm going to sponsor the eSport to reach the gamer, you know? And it's like, it's one type of person, right? Well, we never talk about the the traditional sports audience like that, right? It's not like, are you sponsoring sports? Do you want to reach the sports audience? It's 7 billion people globally, you know? You know we're, we're like, hey, you know, Major League Baseball, this is that audience. And so that's my target market, whatever. Uh, National Basketball Association or, or soccer uh, more, more globally. Um, can you share a little bit about some of those intricacies within that 18 to 34 that you've seen with your experience, League on one side, Valor on the other, and any other context you'd like to add? Yeah, and I, I think one of the things um, that you just hit on there, John, and I'll, I'll try to use more Chicago references just because of because of where we're going and because of Megan. Okay. Um, <laughs> so like to that or, point, or <laughs> oh no, <keep> going. <laughs> um, so like when when people are looking at that and when we go out to market, right? And in many, let's call it like someone was looking to maybe be a partner of the Chicago Bulls. My guess is their first question isn't going to be hey, Chicago Bulls, do you have any data on how many pickup games have been played in basketball within the city or within the suburbs in the last two years, right? No one's going to say, hey, is AAU basketball getting better or worse? Is anything going on at high school? Because it's basketball. Same thing with football, same thing with baseball, right? But invariably, when it gets to gaming, there's this mindset of, oh, well, if I'm reaching them, then I obviously get into the game, right? And in many ways, the competitive ecosystem is not a subset, but it's it's a portion of that game, right? There's a lot of crossover. And I think there are some very unique understandings that I'll, I'll jump into here that are different from traditional sports. But it's not just, well, is the game big? And is the sport big, right? Like the Bulls could be just crushing it but maybe the NBA is having a down year. It doesn't mean that you're going to go, ah, well, you know, that's that's it, right? Like these things happen, sports fluctuates, teams, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think we've been able to continue to see growth and trajectory and everything kind of up into the right or even when we plateau, it's almost purposeful as we're trying to go through it, right? Um, and I think as we start to look, you know, a little bit more granularly at like who these people are, What's fascinating, and this is this actually carries through to to both league and Val, and I think it actually carries through to just just gaming and quote unquote esports in general, right? Which is that a lot of people watch the competitive ecosystem to get better, right? Like very few people would say like I'm watching the Lakers because I really want to understand how LeBron hits a jump shot. Like yeah, sure, but you're probably not going to put that on repeat and repeat, not to mention it's, you know, practices are always guarded and gated, right? In gaming, you've got streamers. The same pro that you see that's playing on the weekends or during the day of the week, right, is then on streaming. It's basically like, hey, Steph Curry, I'm going to watch you shoot free throws for three and a half hours, right? Like, what are you doing as you're talking to that community on a one-to-one basis? Like, how many people will be like, oh my gosh, Steph, let me chat at you and then have him stop shooting a three, turn around and be like, oh, it's a great call. Let me go do this. Like probably not going to ever happen unless you go through a lot of red tape and then still probably will not be publicized. Right. But in this case, you have individuals that play the game, they watch and they want to learn how to better play and understand what to do because it is literally the highest pinnacle. Right. It's the keys are the same. It's just how you move those keys, right? My, I, I'm trash, just put it that way. I'm frankly, I think I'm trash at every Riot title, which is amazing at the same Pretty time. company here. This is yeah. the judgment free zone. Yeah. I Judge love club. them um, and I will watch them all and I want to get better, right? But like, that's the thing. You watch people and you get better at it. So I think that is a, a slightly different nuance as well, just with the demographics of, of who this audience is, who these individuals are. It's aspirational, but it's also educational, right? And that's where the VODs come in. And obviously, if you have a partner, that stuff carries through. They're watching VODs over and over and over again. And we know that data from Nielsen, it's not just live viewing, it's live plus three. And there's a lot of that happening. Obviously different time zones play into it, right? But as you start to look at some of those subsets, you still do see a lot of like similarities, right? They're they're still young young men and women, right? Like league skews a 
a little bit more male. The Valorant actually skews a little bit more female. Um, we've done a, had a very strong concerted effort with game changers, both at a regional level and, and global level, which I think is unbelievable just to be able to bring that forward. Um, but you have individuals who are very excited in, in just entertainment and, and you know, kind of getting into all of that, that genre. You might have smaller subsets where like, hey, maybe anime leans a little bit more with Lee then you know maybe music is a little bit more mind you i can't say that because we've had almost 200 songs that riot music is made just for league uh and a multiple two to bands but it's slightly different right like league is a little bit more cerebral which valorant obviously is i don't want leo or anybody coming after me um but at the same time you also have valorant which it's just like a, it's almost like penalty kicks from the get-go, right? It's like two hours of just penalty kicks because you're going and going and going. And so that type of wiring, I think for people that see it and love it, if you want a little bit more of a break, hey, League is there, it's cerebral. You're still gonna have big team fights, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, Valorant's just kind of like there, it's in your face, it's go, go, go. And then people are also doing, continue to just make new changes, new skill sets, new combinations of, of abilities and stuff that work, huh? That's fascinating. I didn't even know that was possible. Let's take a look at it. So, yeah, that's really interesting to hear from your perspective. Um, coincidentally, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, do you watch LeBron to um, learn how to do a jump shot and stuff? I learned something from Michael Jordan that I don't know how many people have. Um, I learned how to hold a spoon because of Michael Jordan. And this is the truth is when I was a kid, I ate Wheaties. I was probably the only four-year-old eating Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions though. Um, and Michael Jordan was on the box and I used to hold my spoon like a little kid, you know, like this. And I, Jordan, you know, the goat, arguably, he's holding his spoon like an adult, like one would. And I literally learned how to hold my spoon from looking at Michael Jordan on the Wheaties box. So... We're so glad that you use your utensils properly, especially with these dinners we invite you to and, and That's such. Right. Yes. That'd be one Thank of the best members. Michael Jordan. We know he's watching. I'm or sure he is. He's, a, he's a busy guy, so he's probably just listening. Um, That's true. <laughs> a question. So to segue that into, I feel like this is a question both for Megan and for Matt here. You both being Chicago natives. We are bringing a lot of people to the Esports Trade Association Conference, Esports Next, who are from outside of Chicago, myself included. Um, I want you to give me each two things. What does someone coming to Chicago need to experience about the city this weekend? Megan, I'm going to have you do one and then Matt do one and then. We'll yeah, I'm going to go first. Please. I can't, I can't, I don't even know where to start, but I'm just going to start with our first event. Everyone needs to see Wrigley Field. If, I mean, sure. if you, who, first off, who doesn't like a baseball game? I do at least one a year. Hot dog. Mandatory. Yep. Mandatory. Neighborhood walk after game. It's a month. It's all, it's a no brainer that for me, I've never been to anything like it. Nothing compares to Wrigleyville. The audience is voting at home, by the way, as we're, I'm watching the score happening now. Uh, Matt, give me your, your first uh, Chicago recommendation. Uh, well, I need to plus one. Also, as a Cubs fan, I have to plus one Wrigley. Um, also, the rooftops at Wrigley, which is an experience I think is is literally that just doesn't exist anywhere. And even if you're a White Sox fan, and trust me, I have a lot of White Sox fan friends, as much as that's a one character flaw, they can still enjoy Wrigley Field. Um, that's right. What I will also say is, I'm gonna, I'm not, I don't want to cheat, but I'm going to say two things. So I'm going to suggest, mind you, community aside, Walking down the river walk, which has now been completed and being able to see the city that way mm. and walking over to Pequod's and getting an amazing deep dish pizza. That is not, even though I love Malnati's, but there is something with Pequod's with the crust that yeah. I think it's just people don't know about and you should because it's They really, don't. That is the best pizza in Chicago. Really yeah, good. No, you know your city. <laughs> I lived in Chicago for a long time. Come on now. So what's also so neat that Matt's talking uh, about, John? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. John? I was just going to say, I, I wanted to uh, pause you for a minute, Megan, just to acknowledge uh, Matt's ability to sneak in two recommendations in one, um, which is a great partnership person, you know, always be closing, right? Yes. So 
<laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Just had to call you out on that, Matt. Oh, I think the, the the lake and the river connecting is so neat. And where we're where we're staying at the Radisson Blue is so beautiful. Their sapphire brand right there on the river. Um, yeah. And just the convenience, no car needed. I love having people come to town and I'm like, just Uber or, you know, take yeah. the train. It's always like, nice. No, no, no car. Like your, your, your trip starts when you get off that plane and you have no keys in your hand and you don't need to put your keys in your hand till you get home. And that's, so that's if you're like, a skateboarder. The, the worst part of my skateboarding experience is having to carry those rental keys in my pocket while I'm skateboarding because they give you two and they're the biggest ones possible and they're tethered together with like the, the little metal thing. It's like, I can't skate with this in my pocket. And I'm definitely not asking that kid to watch my car keys. So um, the skaters can relate on that one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me bring us back. Megan, I'm going to give you one more recommendation. And Matt, even though you broke the rules... Uh, we'll you know what? I'm right. gonna go. I'm gonna go on a limb. There's, there's. I have two because I like partnerships too. I love. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Chicago Midwest people, Ooh. and I think that Chicago has had a bad rap. And I, I, I just am really excited for everyone to come and really see that we're okay. And um, number two, right on, like right. If you go to Lakeshore, like Matt was talking about, and take that walk, there is like the greatest beach two blocks from our hotel called Ohio Beach. Like no one knows about it. And it's an opportunity to take a less than a five minute walk, take your shoes off, get in the lake, take a walk. And then there's a Mediterranean bar right on that beach that serves authentic like food and drinks. And it's actually voted one of the best spots in town to eat. Um, so I love that. Answers. Nicely done. I see Thank you're just, you. you're, you know, you can't let anybody outperform you MVP. And that's one of the things I love about you is you're. Oh, thank you, John. You're always like, pulling me back by the hood though. Like slow that, down that, MVP. <laughs> that is our Does dynamic. that also mean that lunch is sponsored by that Mediterranean bar? Is that why you threw that in there, Megan? I'm just kidding. You know, you're, you, know, uh, yes. you, know who, you know what? You're going to be so happy, Matt. Our lunch is a Chicago theme lunch. And we have Portillo's, we have a deep dish pizza, and we literally have Eli Cheesecake, the family, delivering a whole sweet table. Oh, yeah. I That's know. amazing. There's so much goodness. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Matt, um, give me your last recommendation, and then we'll actually get back to esports for people uh, tuning back. <laughs> Go away from the uh, the travel podcast that, that we just jumped into. Um, yeah, it's all in your I, I will... I will try to just do a quick tack on to what Megan was saying, which is just, just down on that same area towards the lake. There's like, even if you start walking south a little bit, going down towards the museums and you're not going to have to walk all the way down to Soldier Field, but um, just being out on that lake area, I mean, it it is beautiful. Obviously, Lake Michigan is a great lake, as we were discussing earlier. You cannot see the other side. Um, and it's, I think it's also very scenic. If you look back at the city, it gives you a real sense of, what the city looks like. You can see a lot of the skyline and um, you know all those wonderful photos that people tend to have on the back of like the back of bars or restaurants or other things where it's like windy city. It's it's the same type of skyline that you get a chance to look at. And obviously the skyline has changed a lot. So yeah, I would say that that's another great, another great thing to do. Yeah, I love that. Um, Matt, you're somebody who, you know, you've stated you found your your dream job at Riot and you have a more traditional uh beginning to your career with traditional marketing, advertising, things of that nature. We have all sorts of people who are listening and attending the conference who are either looking how to get into the industry to work with like with a publisher, with a team, et cetera, or they, they have B2B companies and they're saying, how can my company integrate, get involved in esports? As someone who has come from outside of the space and, and now been in it for about five years, what is your recommendation for some of these people um, how they can get into this space as well. 
Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, and I think like you know the the simple answer is like don't give up or don't quit if you're passionate about it. Um, because it's very often that people are like ah, it's a closed door. Or I sent out three emails or I called someone and they didn't respond to me, so I guess I'm not wanted, right? Um, you don't know exactly what type of transferable skills are actually needed in that particular moment, right? You might read a JD and say, oh my gosh, I can do this one bullet, but I can't do these other things. You might be exactly who that that organization or publisher is looking for. Or you might read something and say, I check off on every one of these boxes. I've been doing this for 10 years and it might be not who they're looking for, right? Because everyone else around you is kind of that same mentality. So I think Mm -hmm. a lot of it is like, don't give up, reach out to people. I think you will find the community is very welcoming, right? Like we are welcoming. We obviously know the community can be extremely joyous when you go to certain, um, channels and platforms. Uh, But at the same time, like that passion is because people care, right? Like they care about it, which is why people are passionate. If people didn't care about this or didn't have any emotional connection, there's not chatter, right? Like there aren't a bunch of, at least I don't think, although it is Reddit, so maybe there are, there's probably not a a lot of subreddits about grass growing, right? Or like, you know, paint drying necessarily where people are complaining, but you will find that with every single patch release from pretty much every title ever, right? So I think it's that, but more so it's not just, I want to get into gaming or I love gaming and esports. Now, a lot of times I'll have people even will reach out and say, I'm, I'm a gamer, I should be in. I'm like, but that's kind of table stakes, right? If you're coming into the space, uh, you know, same thing. If I've never played tennis before, I'm sure the tennis association would probably not say like, you're my first choice. Do you know what's happening? Like, no, I don't know what the scoring is, right? So that's kind of there, but it's also where, like, where do you want to focus? And I think that sometimes gets, it's the fog of war. Like, I don't know, I'm in gaming, I'm in esports. What am I doing? I mean, there are TOs, there's the production side, there's the business development side, there's the operational side, there's the solution side and packaging. And then there's just like, how do you explain this space to people who might be 20 years older, 30 years older, who have absolutely no idea why kids are doing this and making money and like complain about it at the same time are like, I think my kids or nephews spend X amount of money every month because I keep seeing these microtransactions on my credit card and I don't know what it is, but they keep doing it and they keep asking and I'm supposed to talk to you. So like, I think it's a lot of just trying to figure out what what do you want to do, right? If someone's like, oh, I really want to go here. You don't have to go to a publisher. You can go to a team. You can go to a TO. There's a lot of levels, a lot of areas where you can really deliver value to this ecosystem, um, particularly at the, the community side of things and really trying to evangelize, not just guys who look like me, right? But like actual people that are out there that are playing um, and players. And so I think a lot of it really just comes down to like, try and get a sense of where you want to go and then approach it that way, right? Don't come in and say, ooh, I can do BD and production. Ooh, and I'm really good at competitive ops. And it's like, well, pick, try to pick one, right? Um, It's kind of like, when people were going to college, it's like, what major are you going to be? And if people didn't know, sometimes they're like, I don't know, I want to go to the school. I'll, I guess I'll just be liberal arts and then I'll change that in a year. And then sometimes they're yeah. like, why would I change it? Liberal arts is exactly what I want. So I think sometimes it's just, where do you want to start? And if you approach it that way, it allows others to also understand, oh, okay. Or they might tell you, you might actually be a really good fit for this role and you just don't know it yet. Yeah, that's actually great advice about the single focus. Um, I had years ago, I was looking for a new job and I had been in a job before where I did all sorts of stuff like startup mode. It's like, oh, I could be an account executive or I could do marketing or I could, you know, do sales or I could blah, 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 all these things. And I talked to a recruiter and this had nothing to do with esports at the time, but I talked to a recruiter and he said, John, when I hear all these things from you, I can do this, that, the other. I don't know what to do with you. Pick one. Pick the one that you think you are best at or you would enjoy most, or maybe, you know, maybe the salaries are higher than that, whatever, like, but just pick one for a specific reason. And then now I know what to do with you. And also our careers are not one step. So sometimes just if if you want to, project management was the thing that I chose based on a number of things. I don't want to be a project manager, but I knew that was my best opportunity at the time to take the next step. And so identify with your experience, what can I do today to get my foot in the door? You may end up working at Riot Games and end up being maybe a social media manager, or maybe you're uh, doing partnerships with Matt or something like that, because once you were inside, 
the inside team identified, hey, you know what? We've got an opening over here and I think you'd be really good at it sort of a thing. So I love that. The only other thing I would add to your answer, Matt, which was fantastic, is what is your motivation? What is your mm. intention for being in this space? Because what I've found, even for the B2B boomer <laughs> who might capitalize esports incorrectly uh, until they're told how we're doing it these days, is when you have a pure intent to add value, and you use that word, adding value to the community, you're accepted. You don't have to be great at video games. You don't have to be an expert in every video game. You have to be here for the right reasons. And that's to put others ahead of yourself and to say, how can I add value to you in order to be part of this community? And if you do those things, I think you have a, a, a great op opportunity to, to find a role in this industry. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Megan? No, that that's just great. And and Riot really has done such a good job from a local to global um scale. I've witnessed it myself. I have so many people that I that that I would like to experience what I experienced last year. And um yeah, thank you so much for taking your time with us and coming out and speaking on the panels. You want to share a little bit about um, what what the panel uh, will be about uh, you, without giving away too much of the sauce? A piece for the audience. Um, I believe we are going to have a very spirited and wonderful discussion to talk about some of the best ways to level up some of the marketing and partnership um, areas. So like, what are the best ways to enter into the space? What are some of the positives? What are some of the potential trade-offs that you need to think about? Um, and really ideally help people understand maybe some of those footings or just clear up some of that fog of war, right? And I think that's a lot of just education in general, I think is a continued thing, right? The industry is still very young and there's a lot of different ways to go into it. And if you look at it, you just might banner blindness. Like, I don't know what this is. I'm confused. I'm walking away, right? But gaming is not going anywhere, right? It's only going to become bigger. It's only going to become more part of everyone's DNA, right? That younger demographic, those Gen Zs, like this is what they know, right? Like that's that, this is all they know. It's not that you're educating. It's just, yeah, of course, this is how you do things, right? Of course, I watch something on Twitch. Of course I go here, right? So I think it's, trying to help maybe integrate, like what is that bridge in between some of the traditionalized marketing approaches? And then how does this maybe interact with the community? Um, so I'm very excited to have a spirited discussion. I'm sure someone will tell me to stop talking because I will sometimes go off on a tangent, but it, it should be fun. Um, there's one last thing and I know we're, we're at time, but John, you were just talking about like my passion or where, where we are. And I think going back into that, like it is about delivering value, right? It's of course, like we're, we're trying to make everything sustainable, bring in partners that deliver value back into this, support our teams. But we really believe in the competitive scene being a lifelong pursuit. So we need to set that up. What does that look like? How do we go about it? What does that infrastructure look like? Where are you involved? Where are you not? And so really for myself and team, it's like, I always think of us as a big family, right? We are a big family. We're trying to help our players in every way possible. Uh, and same thing with those partners that come in. It's how do we bring those partners in? How are they part of the family? And how do we help them connect with this community, right? Like that's a lot of what they're asking us to do. And then it's when you have that symbiotic, hey, here's how our customers are looking at things. Great. Here's how our community and players are looking at things. What is that intersection? I think that's really when you can try and level everything up, right? Big expectations, but you take little little pieces here and there and you know you find some small wins and, and move forward. I love that. Well, I'm personally very excited to hear your insights in the panel along with your other panelists. And for those listening, you know, if you heard something you want to hear more of or um, you want to meet Matt in person, we greatly urge you join us in Chicago, um, August 20th through 22nd. We're going to have a fantastic time learning a lot of new things. And then we're also going to enjoy some, if not all, of the enjoyable things uh, that Matt and Megan shared um, that you should enjoy in Chicago. So um, thank you, Matt, once again for joining us on this episode of the Esports Next podcast. Thank you, guys.